fun. So everyone's got the headphones on. Good, because it's quite weird without them. I can see lots of people without headphones. You're very naughty, but hopefully you'll be okay. So my name is Justin Pierce. I'm the editor of New Digital Age. Uh, I'm joined by the amazing Lydia Oakes, who's MD of Blue Shop Communications, and the amazing Justin Reed, who's a mere media director at TripAdvisor. And we're going to talk a bit about how to use PR in this crazy industry. I mean, I've been around for kind of going on 30 years in this industry, and it just gets busier and busier and busier, and PR is one of the most effective ways to get your story across. So let's find out how to do it most effectively. So first question is, I mean, since the pandemic, newsrooms have shrunk. When I was a journalist, you know, 25, 30 years ago, I had a big team of reporters, and now publications have shrunk. So how do you get your story across? Lid, let's start with you. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Newsrooms have shrunk. That started before the pandemic with the rise of digital um, and the 24-hour news cycle as well. And, you know, you've seen the reduction of monthly trade titles, weekly trade titles. It's, you know, it's changed up massively. Um, pandemic just accelerated that. Um, so I think it really comes down to one fundamental thing, and that is storytelling. Um, you know, we chat to a lot of clients and, you know, prospects, and they say, you know, we're unique. Um, <laughs> no one's unique. No one's unique. Um, there is a lot of noise, that, and you need to cut through that noise. Um, journalists have a finite amount of time. Their inboxes are ridiculous. So you have to be able to know your own story to then be able to communicate that. And that's about having a very clear narrative and telling that across every element of your, you know, your earned channels, your paid channels. Um, and do that in, in a consistent way. Justin, same to you. I mean, when you look out now at the media landscape, I mean, how, I guess, how nervous about, are you about telling, telling your story, especially in, in B2B, which I guess is sort of the, your main challenge at the moment? Yeah, well, you were the one who brought up COVID. Um, I did. And, Sorry. And obviously, TripAdvisor is a, a, a platform, a company that is was largely, not largely, almost totally reliant on travel. So prior to COVID, and again, you brought it up, um, we didn't really need to do B2B PR. Uh, we were very lucky. We had a very loyal audience. If you wanted to travel, you came to TripAdvisor. If brands that were integrated with travel wanted to advertise, they knew that TripAdvisor was the largest travel audience, so they'd come to TripAdvisor. Um, and we kind of existed in this vacuum where any... B2C PR, yes, but B2B PR, eh, who needs it? Um, and then COVID hit, and no one traveled for what seemed like three years, but was actually about six months, and then he came back in pockets, and then they went away again. But still within the travel industry, we still talk about getting back to 2019 levels. So suddenly we went from not needing any, uh, you know, any voice to go out there in the marketplace to being, hang on a minute, no one's traveling, what on earth are we going to how on earth are we going to monetize our audience? And so then we had to start thinking about, okay, forget about long uh, overseas travel. It's about what you're doing in your local neighborhood, what are you doing tonight, what are you doing this weekend? And that's when we realized that it's no good at relying on our audience to come to us. We have to start talking you know, to a much broader, not just audience, but a broader framework of partners, of advertisers, whoever it might be, who actually are, are, are interested an, in an audience, but the knowledge about our audience outside of travel was almost totally unknown. So it was really then about like, okay, this is, you know, this is the lowest we're gonna be for travel. We can no longer rely on, on, on organic PR. We now have to really ramp up uh, what it is we're talking, who, who we're talking to, and we didn't have the expertise. So that's why, you know, for us, the, the biggest change that we've seen since COVID, again, you brought it up, is this idea that, you know, we constantly need to not just us be talking, but have multiple voices in multiple areas talking to multiple different platforms, publications, newsrooms, all these things that us as TripAdvisor as a brand don't naturally have access to, hence, needs for PR. So with those difficult sort of, you have to talk to many different newsrooms and platforms and magazines, all these different new sorts of people, I guess then moving on to reflecting what Lid was saying about uh, relationships, how important are relationships, especially when you look at PR and how important is, I guess, 
trust. I mean, it, it's you can't overestimate it. You can't overstate it. Um, and I think TripAdvisor, I'm not going to sit here and go on about, wang on about TripAdvisor all the time. But I think TripAdvisor as a consumer brand is almost the embodiment of what a good PR is for a B2B brand. We have, or rather, business. The Truman Brewery has lots of little micro PR agencies in consumers leaving reviews saying this is great, this is great, which is much better than the Truman Brewery going out and saying we're great. Consequently, when we work, when we talk about connections, uh, contacts, you know, m relationships, it's all well and good for, for someone like me to try and build those, but it's much easier to cliche coming up, but stand on the shoulders of giants and like, you know, work with people who already have those relationships. And then, you know, the credibility of, uh, of TripAdvisor or TripAdvisor people or TripAdvisor research, TripAdvisor insights, getting through to the likes of campaign, you know, new digital age, you know, performance weekly, whatever it might be. It's entirely contingent upon those relationships that have been built out by the likes of, dare I say it, yourself. Uh, and how do we leverage those on an ongoing basis? Well, I like the standing on the shoulders of giants and I won't make a joke about Lydia's size at all because <laughs> I get shouted up. But Lyd, relationships, I mean, talk about how important relationships are. And I guess for me, what's interesting is how they've changed and how they are changing from the old days when you had teams of massive journalists who so struck up relationships crazy. How are relationships with journalists nowadays? Yeah, I think um, relationships have developed. I think that the ultimate relationship between a journalist and a spokesperson has remained the same. Um, and I think we forget that it's a mutual reliance. Um, so the spokesperson is looking to communicate their ideas and see coverage, whether that's written, video, audio, they, they're looking for an outcome. Uh, the journalist isn't the expert on your topic. Um, for them to fill their pages or online, they need spokesperson, and I think sometimes that gets forgotten and lost. So it's about having, building that relationship of trust between the journalist and the spokesperson, and also between, you know, your agency should have those relationships with those journalists and have established those over a number of years. And they're based on trust, they're based on, you know, a reliance on being given honest information and being given it in a timely fashion. And also, you know, if there is a crisis, handling that in a professional way, in an honest way as well, in an authentic way. Uh, you know, a lot of what we do is also around crisis management for clients. Um, so it's about understanding how those relationships can be leveraged and how they're built over time. I think understanding that journalists have less time as well. So when you are talking to them, make it work, make, make it matter, you know, and that there's an old adage about kind of junior PRs ringing up constantly saying, have you got my press release? Have you read my press release? Will you be covering my press release? You know, you cannot miss, you cannot abuse a journalist's time like that. It, it's just, they don't have that. And they're not gonna answer you. They're not gonna pick up the phone. So it's about establishing mutual respect um, and building a relationship. And understanding also, journalists don't have to cover you. No, that's a good point. And I think, yeah, I remember watching you in Cannes last, was it last week, very recently, dealing with a PR crisis. And it is about that relationship and trust. I know when I was sort of starting off, I'd find the people I trust and I'd talk to them first when I was building a story. But let's talk a bit about uh, events, because PR can run across many different trade publications, events, and online, social. Uh, events like Madfest, one of the highlights of the year for me. How, does, how do events play into an overall PR strategy? And Justin, What's your view? What's the role of events like Matt or Cannes? Or um, it's interesting because it's coming. We're coming off the back of Cannes, which was last week, which is for me. I've, 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 I'm, despite my age, I've only been there three times uh, the last oh, three yeah. years, and every year it seems to be something different. We get something different out of it. But I would summarise this, and I'm not paid. To, I'm definitely not paid to say this, but like. I think the, you can condense the best of a week in Cannes into a day at Madfest. And I think it's that notion that uh, if you really want to condense in your important meetings, you know, getting on the stage uh, you know, to, talk, to talk to an audience like this, you're probably actually talking more directly than would you at one of the litany events that are on the, I always call it the croissant, it's not the croissant, it's the 
Was that it? sounds good. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Al along the front kind of thing where so much of it is about having a bit of branding up, uh, putting on an event, and the only people there are the people you know who work for you kind of thing. So I think it's the it's definitely events are um, it's it's all about the quality and the qual not just the quality of the audience, the quality of the time you can spend with people in the audience and get across you know what your message uh, is. And quite often, especially since we're talking about PR. The best, um, not to sound too cynical, but the best PR outcome, you know, you, you well, maybe not you, or maybe not you, but I can this is like, oh, did you see that guy from TripAdvisor? Yeah, you know, just simply something as small as that as saying, oh, do you remember, don't I remember my name? Oh, TripAdvisor on the stage at Madfest. That is a huge PR win. So I think things like that are, you know, really the test of what, what, what these kind of events are. Totally agree. Lid, well, I mean, with, with your clients, how do events like Madfest fit in for strategy? I think they're hugely important. I think, you know, PR sometimes is equated to media relations. Um, it's actually, you know, much larger than that. And it's about supporting your marketing strategy. There's no point in having a marketing strategy going in one direction and a PR strategy going in the opposite. You know, they should be aligned. You should be, you know, when everyone's scrutinizing budgets, you have to have a strategy that's completely aligned and that's you know, mutually supporting so that you're making absolutely every pound work. So, you know, events, they are bringing people together. You've got, you know, support for your sales staff. Um, and, you know, there's a huge amount of brand awareness from an event like this. Um, so I think they're hugely important. I think also to bear in mind are the smaller scale events, so, and I think, you know, having a strategy that also includes bespoke events where you can get in front of those 10 individuals um, has a, a, a mutual benefit to having that, that massive brand awareness here and also being able to kind of connect with a lot of people in one place. So I think there's, you know, Cannes, Madfest, Advertising Week Europe, you know, some of the one possible in Miami, they all have their place in the calendar. And I think it's about understanding how you can use each one to support um, an individual objective um, and making the most out of them. Okay, let's talk a bit about owned media. And obviously, we, we discussed how the sort of the trade media has shrunk and is shrinking. Uh, and nowadays, brands can very easily create their own media using sort of social media channels or online channels or whatever they want. But Justin, do you see owned media as a way to communicate with audiences? Yeah, but it, it's it's obviously it's part of. You know, own media on its own won't get you where you need to be because you're back into the don't shout, start talking, uh, you know, about PR. And if all, if, if your entire, you know, B2B messaging relies on you saying, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're back to the stone age of, of you know, travel reviews, for instance, you know. Uh, so I would rep I, I'd look at, you know, B2B messaging, own platforms in the same way that, a hotel or restaurant or attraction would have looked at their messaging in 2000. It's not enough to say, we are doing this. You need other people to say, they are doing that. And I think uh, that's where, you know, we can have a message that we want to put out, but it has, of course, it has so much more authenticity if it's coming in a trade publication or in a, you know, a press release that gets picked up in, in multiple areas, or even just simply, uh, if you think of the micro brand of, you know, brand Justin or brand Lydia, you know, a, a B2B website saying we're doing this is one thing. But an individual within that company, not just cutting and pasting the corporate message, but putting their own personal feel on it and posting that in LinkedIn, that's like a micro, you know, a micro self PR agency, which I think is quite important to like, you know, get away from this. Uh, nothing depresses me more. Actually, no, there's lots of things to depress me more, <laughs> but like one of the things that does depress me is when you see a company, and we do it, we're guilty of it, is, uh, oh, put out this message, right, about, you know, we're releasing something or we're doing a new partnership, and suddenly you go into your LinkedIn feed, and every single person from TripAdvisor has posted the same thing, and that to me just looks like spam. That's not authentic, that's not engaging, that's not, uh, that's not talking, that literally is shouting. So, you know, put your own personal spin on your corporate message by all means, but don't just, you know, regurgitate it, spit it out, because we're back to shouting, not talking. Yeah, really good point. I mean, Lid, how do you work with clients to ensure that it is authentic and engaging, but it's their own owned media? I think it's very much um, 
working with them from the beginning, looking at their messaging and going through a messaging process um, where we can actually determine what those core messages are and then create a narrative around it. You know, we talked about storytelling right at the beginning. That's where that is um, created and refined. And then it's about how do we um, get that out through different channels. But I think the authentic part of it is a really important one. You've got to be able to stand up that story. You've got to be able to back it up with examples and illustrate it with client case studies and all of the materials um, and be able to go out and talk about it consistently. Now, that doesn't mean parrot fashion, as, um, as Justin was saying. Um, it's about having your own tone of voice as well. Um, it, it's incredible, you know, we, we've got thousands of, of brands here today. You know, having an individual voice is incredibly important. Otherwise, why should I work with one company over another? So, you know, a lot of what, you know, especially in the ad tech sector, um, a lot of what, you know, people are doing is quite similar, you know, and it's why would I work with company A over company B? It's going to be about what they're saying is resonating with me and their tone of voice resonates with me. So it's about developing that narrative and that individual tone of voice and bringing the whole company along. Um, you know, not parrot fashion, but having those individual you know, ambassadors, each of them um, has a, a, an opportunity to be amplifying your messages, um, but they need to add their own, own spin to that. Now, we've only got four minutes left. So let's try and get this tough question into four minutes. How do you measure PR? That's often the criticism is how do you measure it? You can measure on advertising, but how do you measure PR? Justin, quickly, you've got two minutes. How do you measure it? Uh, how do you measure You it? start off with your PR plan and you work out, you track everything, basically. So you track every single conversation. I liken it to, uh, oh, what cliche can I use? Throwing a stone in a pond. <laughs> and you don't quite know where that ripple is going to end up. That ripple could, uh, you know, your stone, or skimming a stone, shall we say. So you skim a stone, it could just pop, and that's it. But, you know, it might create a little bit of impact. But that's, that stone that you skim across the water might suddenly hit one publication, another publication, another publication, another publication. And all these things ripple out, ripple out, ripple out. And, you know, uh, you don't know what the knock-on effect of, like, you know, your, your, your reach, your ROAS, whatever it might be, is until you know who threw that stone and what that stone actually was. So I think it's all about measurement. I think it can be as simple as reach. It can be as simple as, like, eyeballs. It can be as simple as, you know, engagement with that piece of content. But really, for TripAdvisor, we want to make sure that whatever, whatever B2C messaging we're putting out, results in more traffic to the site, more engagement, and whatever B2B messaging we're putting out results in something. Now, that could be a brief, that could be a conversation, that could be a meeting, it could be being invited to, to sit on the stage at Madfest, but something comes out of those things. But again, it's tracking that stone that you skim across the water. Nice poetic answer. Liv, <laughs> you've got two minutes to be as poetic or not. No poetry. Um, I th it's, it's always a tough one. It's always one that comes up in every pitch meeting. You know, PR is not advertising, but there are still ways of measuring it. I think Justin was absolutely right. It's about looking at reach. It's about looking at coverage. It's about looking at the success of events. You know, how many meetings did you have? How, you know, if it's a bespoke round table, you know, has the conversation moved forward? You know, can we see that, you know, having those prospects in the room to discuss that really important issue is now resulting in more conversations that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have invested in that, that small-scale event to bring those people together. Um, so I think it's about those touch points. It's about brand awareness, um, which you can measure. You can do uplift studies. Um, and it's about looking at those, that customer journey and those opportunities to engage, whether it's with coverage, an event, um, viewing an award, you know, seeing you at an award ceremony, picking up an award, whatever it might be across that PR mix, I think there's always opportunities to measure and demonstrate value. Excellent answers. Thank you so much. Well, that's it. We're up against time, but both Blue Stripe with Lydia and True Advisor with Justin have got booze to so go and meet them afterwards. Thank you so much. You've both been amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah.